I'll just start with some um, historical facts. Some five paradigms of computing technology uh, have been there. First, there were electromechanical devices, then relays, vacuum tubes, transistors. Then we moved on to integrated circuits, very large scale integration, ultra large scale integration, etc. And accordingly, we had several generations of computing systems, computers, right? So very early, it was all run by uh, vacuum tubes. Then around the 55 came the use of transistors, the second generation of compu computers. Third generation was integrated circuits. And then uh, we had the fourth generation, which is like uh, VLSI, uh, also ultra large scale uh, integration, parallel processing, AI components getting into hardware, etc. So this Moore's law, you must have heard about, I don't know whether you've heard about Moore's law, uh, of doubling of the number of components per chip every two years. This Moore's law is applied to many different domains, but generally it has held so long. But possibly now it is approaching an end because there's a physical limit to what you can really put in in a single, in a small piece of uh, uh, silicon. So, <coughs> and whenever anything comes towards an end, something happens, some disruption happens, and then a new direction starts. So possibly we are approaching that, and the world now is looking at quantum computing, which will be a paradigm shift, okay? So that is where maybe uh, we'll have this sixth paradigm uh, of quantum computing. So we have had five paradigms there. You can see four and the fifth generation of computers you can see on the right. This might be the sixth paradigm where quantum computing will come into the picture. Accordingly, also in science we've had uh, we are now in the fourth paradigm, right? So first paradigm was empirical, when you observed ex uh, and drew conclusions thousands of years back. You observed the stars, the movement uh, of the stars, etc. Then came theoretical, so uh, you developed models of systems, models to the best of your understanding. There's a nice saying there that essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, then came simulation, what you could not model, you just simulated and tried to see what would happen if you have certain set of conditions. And now we are in this fourth paradigm, which is data-driven science. There's huge amount of data, any domain that you can think of. There's huge amount of data, and uh, what is now happening is the data is going to tell you what is going to happen tomorrow. You may not even want to know why you are predicting certain things that this is going to happen. You may not uh, really understand the reason, but the data tells you that this has happened so long and therefore this is going to happen. The predictive modeling models will become data driven. So that is what is happening if you know of deep learning, for example. Uh, deep learning in some, uh, the deep neural networks, in some cases they are giving fantastically good results. They are failing also in many domains, but in some, they are giving like a quantum jump in the uh, accuracies. But why that is happening, nobody understands. Uh, so nobody understands, uh, there's n very little explanation, very little science behind, uh, you know, trying to understand what is happening. That's what science is. You try to understand the natural systems. You try to understand the phenomena which are going on. So very little understanding is there about why deep networks are doing well, but they are doing well. There's huge amount of data, there's huge amount of computing power in hand, and therefore you can train deep neural networks which are uh, sometimes giving accuracies which are much, much higher than whatever the state of the art uh, was able to give. <coughs> and with this huge amount of data, there uh, has become, I mean, machine, machine learning, artificial intelligence, these things are also uh, are becoming very, very important. In fact, the country now has this national strategy for AI. Most of the countries, you, you can find documents which they have come up with for national strategies for AI for their own countries. We also have, if you go to the Niti Aayog website, you will find this document there, one document there, which gives AI for all. That is the national strategy. And uh, as you can see here, with the explosion of data, we are expecting that a uh, huge amount of data will become available, even if you think of biology. For example, when uh, you, I'll come to that very soon, but uh, when we are sick, then uh, we often get our blood tests done, uh, the pathological tests. Very soon, what we will uh, 
do in 10, 20 years down the line is you know, find out what our DNA contains. Uh, so that uh, for in each individual, if, if you have to store that amount of data, that's a huge amount of data. Uh, along with it comes all the challenges of storage, indexing, retrieval, analysis. So <coughs> data is to AI what food is to humans. So data-driven discoveries is the need of the day, and it will remain the driving forces in the years to come. Therefore, it is a very, very good time, the most ap relevant time, appropriate time, to get into this area, because that is where the world is headed. The way the world is going to change in the years to come, we cannot even begin to imagine. What we are seeing now and what we will uh, see 10 years, even now we have seen that there's a dramatic change from when we were small to now with the, with the smartphone in hand, there's a dramatic change, right? Uh, I've heard one of my friends told me that in Berkeley, in the university, <coughs> there are uh, robots which deliver pizza, okay? And so when this pizza is, uh, when this robot is going with the pizza for delivering the pizza, and if you happen to come on the way, you suppose you step aside, you see the robot coming, you step aside, then the robot whistles and says thank you. So that is where we are headed. Uh, there will be large scale automation, large scale, I mean I don't know, nowadays for example, earlier when my uh, father would go to the market uh, early morning for vegetable shopping, he would, uh, he would know what to buy. Nowadays from the shop people will call uh, how many kgs of uh, potato, how many, whether I want to have brinjal or not, so th there's no prior planning. It's all on the fly that things are happening. That has its own advantages, we are always connected. That has its major disadvantages. We can see um, uh, the disadvantages also among our younger generation, among the kids. Uh, I was surprised to um, uh, read one uh, article a few days back in the newspaper that nowadays uh, there are many two and a half, three year old children being taken to the doctors because of their hearing disabilities, uh, no sorry, speaking disabilities, speech problems, they are unable to speak. And the reason is nobody speaks to them these days. They are always with their tab because that helps them, often the mothers are working, the pa both both parents are working, mother, father, both are working, and therefore if you put the tab, the child eats quickly, uh, does not cry too much, does not disturb the parents, and therefore nobody is speaking, and the child is only bothered about the tab, and uh, is, is not developing uh, properly the speaking abilities. So these are the problems which are coming, and there are ma other, other bigger problems also, which we have to reckon with. There are great opportunities because of this data-driven science now, huge amount of data. Uh, first of all, for the theoreticians, there's big opportunities for doing theoretical work to explain. For example, just I take deep neural networks. Why? What is the science? What is the mathematics behind it that it is performing so well? That, that is open. Nobody knows why. So how to explain? That is, uh, these are the theoretical uh, challenges which will come up in uh, handling data. Innovative applications, uh, it's, it's an open world now. If you can think of an innovative application, anybody sitting anywhere can actually do a lot of business. You, you see with, with the all these apps and everything, uh, innovation is the need of the day. And we have to convert knowledge to wealth, as I said, not only generating knowledge, India has to also become a, a country which owns intellectual property. So that is very important because if we are only using intellectual property owned by others, we'll always be paying others, other countries. We have to generate and own intellectual property in the country, therefore patenting, IP, uh, IPR, uh, having IPR cells, and encouraging the students to patent. I in fact, if you see very recently, DST has uh, revised fellowships, you might have, um, so, um, might have seen that. But at the same time, very interestingly, they have come up with a proposal that if uh, a person actually publishes in very high quality journals, then you pay and also if a person patents. So that is what uh, the push is there, even from the government. So uh, <coughs> with the high intellectual capability and the demand of AI solutions, uh, we have to, including in healthcare, in agriculture, 
and in other areas, we have to become the analytics provider of choice. So what I will go now is to tell you a little bit uh, of the different types of work that I have been doing in biology. But before I do that, I need to tell you a little bit of how the data or what the data that I am dealing with in biology means. Okay. So, uh, but before that, this uh, molecular and there, there have been certain, certain great discoveries, molecular and cellular biology, the discovery of the structure of DNA. That was one of the path breaking uh, things to have happened. Looking at individual molecules in the inside the cells, looking at the entire genomes. What is the genome? I'll come to that very soon. Uh, but uh, the other important advances have been understanding the genetic basis of diseases. So s there is a disease, fine. But is there a genetic basis? I is the reason genetic in nature? And what is that reason? That is something which now we are trying to understand quite a bit. And then, of course, uh, it's a system, right? Even a human body or any living organism, it is a system, it is a whole. And therefore, you have to not only look at individual molecules, what individual molecules are doing, but what the system as a whole does. Pose this problem as a pattern classification problem. As a, uh, so essentially, what I would want to know from the classifier is, if I give MIR1 and mRNA4, will this be a target or a non-target? I don't want to go into the laboratory, biological laboratory, and do the experiment and find out, because that is expensive, time consuming. Can my computational method tell me whether this is likely to be a target or very likely not to be a target? If it is likely not to be a target, I will not bother about it. I will not even see. But if it is a, uh, if my method tells me that with 90% confidence, uh, it is likely to be a target, <coughs> then maybe I will actually test it out in the laboratory and then see what to do about it. So we actually <coughs> uh, developed our own algorithm in this particular domain, as you can see. So this is a pure computational algorithm. And we compared it to many, many, almost all the state-of-the-art methods which were in existence at that point of time. And very interestingly, you can see this is a plot of the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. What is true positive? True positive is when you know that a certain data set is a positive data set, and your method also says that, yes, it is positive. So your prediction matches with the true information. What is false positive? That your method has predicted positive, but in reality, you know that this is not a positive data. Hmm. So that is what true positive, false positives mean. And you can understand that something in the left-hand top corner, that quadrant, uh, that algorithm is associated with high true positive values. You would want high true positive values, but at the same time, you would want low false positive values. See, if, if I am a classifier, so you cannot uh, think of m a person as a classifier. I am a classifier, OK? So I am getting data. And suppose uh, the data has two classes, plus and uh, one and two, or plus and minus class. And for every data point, I say that I am a classifier, and I am saying it's plus. So whatever data comes to me, I am saying it is plus. So you can see that what will be the true positive rate? The true positive rate will be highest here because all the positives will actually be um, classified by me as positive, right? So true positive rate is 100%. But look at the false positive rate. That is also 100% because all the negatives also I have said plus. So that is not a good classifier. That's what I'm trying to. Something which has high true positive does not necessarily, me necessarily mean that it is a very good classifier. It may be a very bad classifier because it may be calling all the data set that it gets in, it may be putting it into one class. So uh, the algorithm that we developed had a very high true positive rate and a low false positive rate, leading us to believe that this was a good algorithm. In fact, we did genome-wide predictions for microRNAs. And because this method was quite well accepted by the community, so there is a data international database called uh, of microRNAs, which is called MIRBase. And they have, uh, along with some standard methods, they have also indexed our uh, our predictions there. But to go on further, this microRNA, as I said, we uh, uh, don't go into this, these systems because these are quite involved. I, but what we did is we actually analyzed, looked at the system as a graph, and then 
analyzed it, those who are from computer science would know breadth first search, etc. So we analyzed it using a breadth first search method. And that BFS method actually put, gave us a very, I very interesting hierarchical structure. We were working on breast cancer specific network in this case. <coughs> so what we found is this interesting hierarchical structure with five molecules on the top level. Then some molecules in the middle level and then other molecules at the lowest level. So those five molecules at the top level gave an indication that those five molecules have something to do. They are important in this cancer. So we looked further into those five molecules, looked at the literature, what is the evidence that we are getting from the literature. And what we found is um, that out of those five molecules, indeed three molecules were known to be onco-MIRs, were known to be involved in breast cancer. But there was not enough information about two molecules, which is MIR202 and MIR155. And these two molecules, therefore, was our prediction that could be novel molecules which people have not looked at but might play important roles in breast cancer. Later on, another group independently va validated M uh, one of those, uh, which they published. So it was sort of a vindication of uh, an a computational study we had done that it did work in biology. But that doesn't mean everything that you predict will work. Okay, so that because the biological system is so complex that how much, uh, you under, how, how much uh, more you understand the system, then you will make less and less errors. But the system is very complicated. And also it has so many pathways which are interacting. You really don't know that if you tweak one here, what is going to happen. So you can only make predictions, but there will be a lot of errors in those predictions. So again, with the same uh, sort of approach, we studied colorectal cancer, and we again came up with some new uh, novel markers. So these were some uh, contributions to biology from a computer science perspective. <coughs> Finally, I'll touch upon one uh, another interesting work that we have done in drug discovery. So discovering small molecules which could act as drugs. And you must remember that the pharmaceutical industries, they spend a huge amount of time and a huge amount of money in their research for discovering new and new drugs. And therefore, they hold on to their secrets. They don't let anyone know what is that molecule. Uh, <coughs> and uh, typically, drugs have been discovered by chance observations. Okay, we look at nature, uh, neem, uh, some molecules from neem or from turmeric, etc. That's how drugs typically have been uh, discovered. But more and more, more we understand the system, what will gradually happen is we will be designing drugs on the computer. But then, of course, we have to test what happens uh, in animals, in humans, etc. Those phases will have to be there. So what we did is we posed this drug design problem as one of optimization. So what is the drug design problem? There is a protein and assume that I know the structure of the protein. And what happens is proteins act by binding to other things. So uh, <coughs> this protein, suppose I know that it is involved in some disease because this protein is uh, has changed itself in such a way that it is not doing its proper function, it is misbehaving. So, and misbehaving because of something which is going on in this particular region of the protein, maybe it's, and that is called active site. So, can I design a small molecule which can go and sit in this active site before a harmful binding happens? So, that is what the drug design problem is. And if you uh, know a little bit, uh, recall a little bit of phys physics, you would uh, know that systems are stable when their associated energy values are low, right? So, this interaction of this small molecule with this protein will be stable when the interaction energy is m minimum. So we posed it as an optimization problem and then applied different optimization techniques that we have worked on, including something called multi-objective optimization, where we want to optimize not a single objective but multiple objectives at the same time. And we applied genetic algorithms and simulated annealing for this problem. These were different energy components that we were trying to optimize simultaneously. So, and we uh, were working for uh, on a protein target called RecA. This is a protein of the bacteria uh, uh, of the tuberculosis bacteria, huh. and it is very important to study uh, or do this sort of research for tuberculosis, for AIDS, for uh, meaning HIV one, because these viruses or bacteria 
they become drug resistant, right? They become drug resistant. You've heard of drug resistance uh, in bacteria and in viruses. Why, why does that drug resistance happen? That is very widespread in India in particular because uh, we are often prescribed or we self-prescribe antibiotics. Okay, we take antibiotics, we don't complete the dose. As soon as the symptoms go away, we, finish, uh, we, we stop taking the medicine. And therefore, the bacteria or the virus, uh, some of them die, and therefore, the symptoms actually uh, disappear, but some survive. Some survive even those medicines, but the point is, those who survive have seen the medicines, have seen the molecule, drug molecules, and they then, then mutate. They change themselves and become drug resistant. That is the problem why when we take antibiotics, first of all, we should take antibiotics very carefully, not rampantly. And secondly, if we do take antibiotics, we should complete the course, even if the symptoms go away earlier. So anyhow, RECA is one uh, protein which is necessary for the survival of the tuberculosis bacteria. We were trying to target that. And using our genetic algorithm-based approach, optimization approach, we designed several possible molecules. Interestingly, what we found is some of those, uh, there's a database which tells us what are the possible molecules for RECI. So some of the molecules we designed happened to appear in that database. So, so we reconstructed some known inhibitors of RECI. At the same time, we also uh, came up with some new molecules, some new inhibitors. These were the, the first part where we reconstructed known inhibitors gave us confidence in our method. And the second part, which were new molecules, that were the novel findings. That is what the interesting part is. But the first part gave us that, okay, maybe possibly our method is not that bad. It is working well. And the second part actually is the novel molecules, which we did some computational studies, but then it is for the biochemists and uh, others, other uh, people from other domains to take up these molecules and test them. But testing is necessary however much you <coughs> you predict that this molecule will be good. What happens is you have designed a small molecule which goes and sits. You want it to block this active site. So it does well, it blocks it. But at the same time, this molecule may go and block some other active sites of some other important proteins. And those are the ones which, which are called off-site binding. And this off-site bindings give rise to the, the side effects of any drug that we take. So we have side effects. Now, you have to weigh how much of side effect is acceptable. If the side effects outweigh the benefit of the drug, then of course you cannot have that drug. You have to reject. And most of the drugs get rejected, and that is why drug research is so time consuming. It takes ages, 10 years, 15 years to come up with a new drug molecule. But this research has to continue. There are some other India-specific diseases where we Tuberculosis, for example, is our disease. I mean, that hardly affects the developed countries. It's a developing country disease, and we have to actually look at these diseases. There was a big, uh, what should I say, uh, initiative from the country, from CSIR, which was called uh, this Open Source Drug Discovery, which was targeting uh, the for, for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it was targeting tuberculosis. So. Uh, these are some related publications uh, where some of these work appear, but of course uh, it's not uh, very much updated. And uh, I should conclude with some acknowledgement. Of course, I do acknowledge my family and my teachers without whom I would not be where I am today. I have to acknowledge the Indian Statistical Institute, which made me what I am. DST, DBT for all types of fundings that I have received. My research has received uh, the uh, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for their support of a certain part of the work that I have presented here. Uh, ICTP Italy is International Center for Theoretical Physics that also has funded my research. And of course, Infosys Foundation and my all my students and collaborators who've made life really worthwhile. Thank you all very much.